Uh, my name's Ash from Emerald First Aid Training um, and as part of our um, presentation what I'd like to do is to go through various bits of uh, first aid um, legislation and sort of what to expect on a course. What we've done is we've kind of split um, our time up this morning into into two different areas. So what we're going to talk about is um, first aid from an employer's point of view. So um, we will we'll look at what the responsibility is of employers, um, different types of training courses and also what to look for in um, a training provider. And then the other part of this morning is going to be uh, for learners. So what are you going to expect if you come on a course with us? Um, also a little bit of how COVID-19 has changed um, our training processes. Um, and also for anybody who's first aid trained, I'll also give a little um, little update on the Resource Council's guidance that was updated earlier this year um, in regards to first aid. So a little bit of CPD um, for first aiders. So to begin with, um, we'll look from a um, employer's point of view, and I'm afraid it's, it's not the most interesting of subjects. It is kind of health and safety area-ish, um, and it's not something that, to be honest, a lot of employers really look for. Um, the majority of em employers that I've dealt with are ones who have maybe had an accident in the workplace and then realised, oh, we probably could have done with a, with a first aider or two to help with that situation. Um, so, uh, like I said, unfortunately, it is is legislation, but it's important because this will have a bearing on on what you what you decide as an employer. So, within the Health and Safety at Work Act, um, there is a section in there um, specifically about first aid that states that um, all employers must uh, protect the health, safety, and welfare of everybody within their workplace, whether that be employees, um, temporary staff. Uh, clients, visitors, um, customers, etc. And within the Health and Safety at Work Act, there is a specific part um, in regards to first aid, which then links to a document that they call the L74, um, which basically outlines a employer's responsibilities. Now, delving into this a little bit uh, uh, deeper, uh, uh, the 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 legislation states that the employer shall provide or ensure there is a provision for equipment and facilities first aid to be rendered to his employees if they become injured or suddenly ill at work. So uh, what I've put here in its very basic form, um, it's up to the employer to ensure that there is a first aid provision. So if someone is first aid trained, it's not up to them to ensure that first aid is compliant, it's up to the employer. And if there is no first aid within the workplace, this comes down to the, the MD, the CEO, whoever has the overall responsibility for health and safety in the workplace. And the HSE, um, in, their, in their wisdom, if you like, um, produced a document um, of which includes um, something that they've produced called a needs assessment. Now, this works exactly the same as a risk assessment. The only difference being there's an extra column on the end um, of, of, the, uh, of the page. And it basically says, based on all of the risks and all of the factors that uh, your business has, what does that mean for a first aid provision? What, what things, you know, what first aid kits do we need? What level of um, you know, trained personnel do we need, how many people we need trained, etc. So when a needs assessment is conducted, these are all the things that, that need to be considered. It's, a, it's the nature of the work, the hazards and risks, size of workforce, visitors, contractors, anybody on site, and plus anything that, that would affect um, the, the need for first aid to be um, uh, given to a, to a casualty on site. It's one of those things that you know we can minimize the risk of accidents happening in the workplace but at the end of the day accidents will happen um you know it takes one person to trip over a box of paperwork it takes you know one person to inadvertently press the plug the wrong way and give themselves a little zap um you know that accidents are going to happen so this is why first aid, regardless of your, your history of accidents, you know, you could be a business who have been running for 30 years and never had an accident. It doesn't deter from the fact that you should still have first aid as a, as a priority and as a, as a plan. 
So because the HSE are, they, you know, they do cover every, every workplace within the UK, basically they leave it up to each business to decide what they feel is appropriate. So every um, business within the UK should have a, a provision, whether that be a written document or whether that be in, you know, a small businesses, business owner's head, there should be a plan um, in, in regards to first aid, but there is no set guidance um in regards of you know something like you have 10 employees you need three first aiders there's nothing setting stone in that um be, simply because every business is different um one of the examples i can give are the major supermarkets um who some some of whom we work with um the big green supermarket they have a a number of um three day first aiders and one day first aiders the uh, big orange supermarket they have one day first aiders and at the moment the big blue supermarket they're doing all of their training online until the middle of july um so three very similar businesses but three very different ways of dealing with um first aid but that is because their risks and their hazards are are different and they would have gone through all of this so as an example um, from a from a business's point of view, I've just plucked a, a business out of the air. Um, so this business that I've, I've chosen to talk about here is a is a family um, farm based business who have nine full time employees, but then during the summer months they will employ around twenty seasonal staff um, because they do tours of the farm to the public and they they have um, sort of rides for the kids and they do tractor and trailer rides etc. And looking through their, their history of accidents, it's mainly related to the, the sort of tractor and trailer rides where um, people have either been bumping their shoulders on the side of the trailer um, or, you know, young children where they're doing sort of pony rides. Um, young children have been have been coming off, off of the ponies just because they've maybe not done it before and lost their balance. So when they've gone through their first aid provision, um, again, nobody's saying this is right, nobody's saying this is wrong, but they believed that this was absolutely sufficient for what they needed. So what they decided was that all of those um, who were full-time employees would undertake a, a three-day first aid at work because this covered um, a lot more injury-based things such as head injuries and spinal injuries. Um, and because they were full-time, they knew that, that they would absolutely have a free day on site at all times. They then decided that um, if any of their seasonal staff were going to be walking members of the public around the farm, that they would be emergency first aid trained so that then they could deal with an absolute emergency um, until a free day first aid or at work could come and assist them. And then they also looked at their first aid kits as well. So they located their first aid kits um, in places where there was high footfall. So maybe the, so the entrance of the farm and sort of the picnic areas that they had available. Um, but then they also issued um, sort of little grab bags to, to anybody who was first aid trained that they wore on their belts and it was highly visible to the public um, that these people were A, first aiders and B, um, had a first aid kit available. So it meant that if an accident did happen, they wouldn't have to transport anybody across, um, across the farm. They could deal with it there and then. So that's one type of business. Um, another type of business that we've um, done some work for was a nursery setting. Um, and they had around 30 children um, from the ages of zero to five um, with about 10 full-time employees and around about five, uh, 10 part-times as well. The layout of the venue was, or the layout of the business was, um, you know, they had three main rooms um, that the children stayed in, sort of dependent on age. So they had the babies and the toddlers and then the, the sort of preschoolers. But then they also had a kitchen on site um, and the communal areas, etc. So when it came to this, um, the, the risk assessment, um, actually this one was, was rather easy um, because being a nursery setting, they have to be Ofsted uh, regulated and Ofsted have their, their own specific requirements for first aid. So that was their first port of call. And Ofsted was stating that anybody who was in the, who was looking after the children, or anybody who's got a level two or level three in childcare, um, must have a paediatric first aid qualification. So for them, it was very easy. Everybody needed to, needed to be trained. But then Ofsted very much look at the care of the children, but as a business owner, they also had to look at the, the health and safety of the, of the employees as well. 
so what they actually decided was for five of the um the the full-time employees to have emergency first aid which is adult based training so that then if any of the uh, care staff any of the the nursery workers got injured themselves they could be treated by someone with the uh, with the correct qualification and they made sort of like a little internal rule that um anybody who was um, emergency first aid at work trained for the adults, they made an internal rule that no more than two of those were allowed off at a time so that they would always have at least two or three people on site with this with this qualification. So that more than satisfied the need um, with Ofsted and it also you know satisfied the need for um, the health and safety executive. So with this business there were there were a couple of things that we needed to, to look at. It wasn't all based on um, you know, the business itself. So that is something that we at Emerald can help with. Um, you know, we've worked with businesses in the past, put in their first aid needs assessment together. Um, and so once you've done this as a business owner, you will come up with, um, a, you may come up with a situation where you actually need trained first aiders. You've made that decision that you need them trained. So then we have a few um, sort of questions such as what qualification or you know what course do they need but then we've also got other quali you know questions like where do we go to get them trained is it convenient etc um you know can we trust every training provider to to give the same level of service all these sorts of things that that we that we all go for as business owners when when deciding we need to make a purchase so what happened in october 2013 um up until this point every first aid training company had to be registered with the HSE. In 2013, the HSE decided, no, that's not suitable anymore. Um, that um, what's going to happen is um, it, we're now going to leave it up to employers to decide who should do their training. And um, it's up to the employers to carry out various different checks on these on these training courses and on these on these training providers. The reason for that was because the HSC realised that um, they were trying to make some of the courses uh, a one size fits all, but because every business is different, that wasn't working. So in essence, what they decided was it's up to businesses to decide what first aid training they need. And they gave three kind of headings um, as to where you could get these training courses from. So the first one was uh, regulated qualification. So any training provider that is offering an off-qual certificate, same as, you know, sort of city and guilds, if you went to the college, those kinds of certificates. You could go to one of the voluntary sector training providers. So St. John's, Red Cross and St. Andrew. Alternatively, you could have what we call either an unregulated or self-certified course, an in-house qualification, um, whereby you know the course you know could be very uh, specific to your to your business. Now we have a, a, a range of courses. These first aid courses are very much um, you know they they are they are standard, but they are adaptable as well. Um, so once you've looked at all your risks and you've decided we need you know, somebody who can deal with seizures or somebody that can deal with bleeding, then you start looking at the different types of courses that you have available to you. And from that, then you make a decision on which course you're going to go to. So we've got emergency first aid, first aid at work, outdoor first aid, pediatric. And again, these are just snippets of, of regulated courses that, that we offer. Um, when it comes to an actual first aid course itself, we can pretty much deliver anything you would like us to. Um, but these are the main ones that, that are, are appropriate for, for businesses. Um, obviously, we've got some ad additional sort of little ones at the bottom, you know, oxygen therapy, catastrophic bleeding. That's if you're in really, really high risk uh, work environments. Each course has, um, has, a, has a set syllabus, a set criteria. Um, and we've taken, uh, I've taken a snapshot of the, the two most popular workplace first aid courses here. So a one day emergency and a, a three day first aid at work. And obviously, you know, when we come to a, a duration, um, you, the longer you're with us, the more things you are going to learn about. So on an emergency first aid at work course, we'll look at roles and responsibilities, CPR, defibs, recovery position, bleeding, seizures, choking, minor burns and minor injuries. But if you if your business is a, is a, a higher risk workplace or you think there's going to be, you know, a high risk of, of injury or or, you know, e extreme illness, 
um, then a free then a free day may be more appropriate. And obviously, we cover all the things in a one day course. Um, but then we also go into what we call a secondary survey, which gives us information regarding to um, you know any injuries or illnesses that the casualty may make. And it is it is all best guess when with first aid, other than an unconscious casualty. Um, everything else is best guess um, because, again, we are training first aiders. We're not trying to train paramedics. You're not going to be able to diagnose absolutely everything. But this is what we would kind of give to an employer to have a look at and, and make a decision over which um, workplace course would be most appropriate for them. And we will work with them to do that. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that there was three different ways um, of undertaking training, one of which was off call, the other was the voluntary sector, and the other was um, an unregulated. Now, the HSC, in their wisdom, uh, when they gave employers this responsibility, um, they put it under the class of what, uh, something we call due diligence. So they say that every business should do due diligence, due diligence on the training that they provide or, or provide to their learners. So what they basically stated was that every, every training course that your business undertakes, you need to check, is the trainer qualified? Do they have the correct experience? Are they keeping their CPD up to date? Is your course that you've taken appropriate to your needs assessment? So the document that we've referred to earlier, you know, if you've discovered that everybody needs a three day first aid at work, why are you putting them on a one day pediatric course? You know, they need to be appropriately matched. Is there something called quality assurance in place? So um, when a when a course is run, um, does that training provider have the necessary qualifications? Are the trainers regularly audited? Um, etc. Is it valid? Is it is it um, you know above board? Does it contain the most up to date information? And importantly, do the certificates conform to the HSE requirements? Because again, that is in the HSE areas. And so what they've done is they've given uh, businesses a checklist. Um, so a lovely checklist of all these different things that as an employer, you should be checking when you employ the services of a training provider. And it's very small text on the screen. Um, that's because there is a lot of stuff on there. Um, so it also means that you've got to, you know, whilst it's all very well saying, you know, has the trainer got the correct training qualifications? Well, would you know what a training qualification looks like? Would you know the difference between a qualification and an, and an in-house certificate? Uh, quality assurance, well, what does that mean? Well, does that mean that the trainer's paperwork is being checked on a regular basis? Does it mean that their CPD is up to date? Um, you know, would you know where to look for to ensure that the information being given to your employees is the up-to-date information or is the trainer five years, 10 years out of date, training um, out of date information. As a business, as a business owner, I would highly doubt unless unless you've done any teaching or, um, or, or have worked in a teaching environment before, I would probably doubt that you will know exactly what you're looking for. So it, I'm not going to lie, it doesn't help business owners what, what the HSE have done here. Um, but there is a slight, there is a, 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 I say a slight way around this. There is a different way, okay. and that is regulated training. So the regulated training is where Emerald First Aid kick in. So we are a regulated provider of off -qual qualifications. So which means that when you um, come on a course with us, we have a certificate that looks like this that's given from our awarding body. And there is a little logo at the bottom of this certificate that um, states that this is a, this is a qualification. And it's quite an important logo. Um, if anybody was to fraudulently put this on an in-house certificate, they can be arrested for fraud. Um, this is quite a serious, um, serious point. Um, by having this logo on a certificate issued to one of your employees, the employer does not have to do the due diligence checks. So that checklist that I just spoke to you about doesn't need to be completed because you have taken a regulated qualification. So in order for us as a training provider to 
um, to be able to provide these qualifications, we already have our due diligence in place. We've done all of that. We've proven that to our awarding body. Our trainers are regularly audited. Our CPD is up to date. We take regular standardization meetings. So, um, you know, even though it's very easy just to sign up to a course, there is so much work that goes into the background um, to being an off-qual regulated um, provider. Um, but that is what we do because we believe that is the, the best for our, our customers. We don't believe that um, just coming on a course, giving you a piece of paper and saying, right, it's all yours now. We don't think that's the right way to work. We want to give the best service to our customers. So, as I said, when we come to where do we fit in um, with the HSE, um, is due diligence required on training um, with us? It's a big no. Uh, with the voluntary sectors, it's a no as well. You don't need to do due diligence on theirs. But if you're taking an unregulated or a self-certified um, certificate, then you will need to complete due diligence. And in order for the HSE to recognise it, that is something you as the employer have to do. The, the training provider can give you um, all the information, but again, as the employer, you have to ensure that it is, is correct. The other part, I think, where people certainly worry about first aid training is the cost, because there are many different first aid courses out there. Um, we've seen courses um, going on online for, you know, £25 online course, etc. Um, this is, you know, workplace first aid courses. Well, online courses don't mean anything in the workplace um, other than CPD. So I thought I'd do a little little sort of cost comparison for you, just so you can see where, where we differ. So these prices were correct as the, as the 8th of June, and these were all available online. Um, so as we can see, St. John's and Red Cross for a one day course, they were charging in the region of 150 to 180 pounds. Um, as a regulated provider, we are charging 84 pounds. And the unregulated um, training provider um, has been charging 72 pound. So in essence, what that means is for the sake of 12 pound, would you know what you're doing with your due diligence? the time it takes you to complete that due diligence and the, the hassle of trying to find out the information that you're trying to get, is that worth £12 of your time? If it is, then unregulated is the way to go. Um, but there are also people who, who believe that, you know, you will only get the best training from St. John's or Red Cross. And whilst I'm not going to knock their training in any way, shape or form, um, you can get that same level of training from other providers as well. And we've proven that by being able to offer these regulated qualifications. So um, so pretty much we, we fall in the middle here where we believe we are very high quality, um, but we are also low cost as well compared to other providers. So if you want the best of both worlds, that's where, that's where Emerald would fit in. So if you are a business owner and um, some, something that we've said in here um, does ring a bell or, or something concerns you at all, we are able to help you in any way, shape or form, whether that be um, completing your needs assessment, um, obviously with no obligation to, to sit on one of our courses. Um, we can arrange training um, for you know, larger businesses. We, we spend a lot of time at other businesses' premises um, and as the last slide proved, we can we can also save you money as well. So we have various different courses. You know, we can bring them all to you if you've got the space. We can come and deliver them. Um, or for smaller businesses, if you only need one or two um, first aid courses, we strongly recommend that you um, save yourself a few pennies and come on one of our open courses that we hold up at Hewish Park. So that's my little bit. Um, for employers, um, again, we will have the, the Q&A session um, towards the end. Um, but this little section is kind of geared towards those who are first aid trained. So anybody who's taken a first aid certificate um, in the last three years, um, some of the things in this will be kind of relevant to yourselves. But also if you're, if you're wondering what happens on a first aid course, you know, maybe you've not been on one before, you haven't been on one for a long time. Um, you know, what happens, what happens these days on a first aid course? So the open courses that we run, we hold at Hewish Park in the, um, for, for larger numbers, we hold in the Alex Stock Lounge. Um, for smaller numbers, for, for sort of six or less, we will hold in the boardroom, which is the other side of the bar, if you know, um, if you know the venue. As you can see currently, everybody is two metres apart. You will get your own table um, and everything, everything is COVID secure from, from the moment you come on site. So 
what we've been doing is we've been trying to minimize um, the amount of paperwork that learners have to go through because we believe that you should be um, learning first aid, not getting hand cramp on filling forms in. So we now do online um, forms. So you'll, you'll have a slip of paper. You'll be asked on your, on your phone or on a tablet if you, if you haven't got a smartphone, we, we provide those. Um, fill in a registration form. Um, the trainer will ask to see your ID because we are delivering regulated qualifications, so passport, driving license, etc. Um, once everybody's in and everyone's got a drink, um, we always make sure everybody's got a drink before we start. Um, then we go for an introduction, make sure, you know, kind of go, go around the room, see who's who. Um, and that's also a good way for the trainer, um, literally within the first few minutes of the course starting, learning about you, learning about the, the hazards and the injuries that you're going to encompass. So whilst we can't change the content, we can certainly change the scenarios to make it more relevant to your workplace. Um, then we go through um, what we're going to go, um, what, what's actually going to be taught on the course, whether it be a one day, three day, etc. Uh, we have regular breaks. So if you are one of these business owners who um, is constantly on the phone or constantly getting phone calls, we do have breaks during the day um, so that you can catch up. Um, and whilst you may see it as, you know, your employer sent you on a first aid course, so you better kind of get on with it, don't necessarily want to be there. Our job at the end of the day is to ensure that all our learners are confident in giving first aid. Um, so we very much change the perception of some of our learners because some of our learners do get sent by employers because they've just been told to do it. Um, so we, we really do change the minds of our, our learners. With it being a regulated qualification, there is, and I'm not gonna lie, I hate using this word. There is an exam at the end. Um, which is always a multiple choice question. So it's one out of four. There are certain pass rates. Um, but again, our, it's our job as trainers to make sure that you pass that qualification. Um, as well as the, um, as well as the, the exam at the end, we also do have to assess you on your practical skills. So if you undertake a, a first aid course, you will be giving CPR on the mannequins. You will be using a defibrillator. You will be putting someone in recovery position, et cetera. And this changes per course, but I'm just picking out the ones that, that always happen on a first aid course. Um, and also we have a laugh as well. These are very adult courses and quite often the tone gets lowered um, by the learners, I might add, not by the trainers. Um, but uh, but yeah, they are good fun as well. And everybody's got different experiences. So as a trainer, I, I always go, even though the content's the same, every course is different. Um, we always ensure that anything that's said in the room stays in the room. Um, so if any, you know, learners wish to speak to our trainers in confidence um, about maybe a situation that's uh, a situation that's happened at home or within the workplace that they'd rather not share with their employer, um, we're there for that as well. Um, and our trainers are, are, are fully qualified to, to a level higher than first aid. So in my nearly five years of training, I've yet to have a question that I've not been able to answer um, because even if you know, even if I don't know this particular illness that a person is, is suffering from, I will find out the information and I will go and get that for them. So, um, you know, we, we are very open. We're very personable people as well. Um, and at the end of the day, we enjoy our jobs. We enjoy training this information. So I think if any, in any kind of training situation, you've got to be passionate. You've got to enjoy training it. Our trainers are definitely that. They bring so much energy and passion into the, into the training room. At the end of the course, we do ask, it is a requirement of our awarding body that we ask for a feedback um, at the end of it. And this isn't a token gesture. This is feedback that is passed on to, um, to ourselves, to our trainers, to our awarding body if they require it. Um, and we do look at it. We do ensure that, um, you know, any feedback that we get, good, bad or indifferent, um, is, is looked at and, and dealt with. So um, for anybody coming on a course, um, again, I've split the, the one day and the three day course here. I've just kind of laid it out a little bit differently. Um, so this is the, the, the kind of content that um, learners would, would be learning on these days. Um, so on a one day course um, is very much unconscious casualty and major um, injuries and illnesses that may happen. 
I will say, but the first day at work, we try and stop them going unconscious. So then we start looking at the the, the injuries and the illnesses, etc. So that's that's the content part of it. But as I say, we've got practicals as well. So obviously, the more more knowledge you have, the more practicals you will be expected to do. Um, so on a one day course, CPR, recovery, defibs, choking and bleeding. And on a first day at work, we do a secondary survey. We get the slings out. Um, we also do some spinal injuries and anaphylaxis as well, which is quite a, an interesting one, seeing how many people inject their own thumb with an EpiPen because they held it upside down. That's always quite an interesting one to see. So COVID, how has that changed our training? Um, well, it, it's changed it to a point, but at the end of the day, first aid is first aid. It is a physical skill. Um, so therefore there are physical elements to it. Um, yes, there is a sort of specific guidance around CPR um, in first aid um, at this moment in time, but they are only temporary measures. And I'm half expecting those measures to be lifted somewhere around September. That's purely my, my opinion of when these are gonna be lifted. So from September, we are back to the way we were um, February, 2020. So as we said, we, we set everybody two meters away. Any close contact that's required, we'll either get you to hand sanitize and glove or, or hand sanitize and, and, and face mask as well. We provide all the PPE. Anybody who's been on our course um, in the past sort of nine months or so, you will have been given an emerald uh, face mask, which hopefully you've been wearing out and about. Uh, we only use one mannequin now, um, which is um, quite scary in the back of the van, having 13 of them rattling around at all times. Um, so previously, you know, it was quite often you get to a group, there's 12 people there and there's three mannequins and you just, you know, you're all sharing, you give it a wipe with the, with the uh, alcohol wipe afterwards and everything's okay. Um, this is something I think we, we are going to carry on um, for a good couple of years. I think the expectation of our, our customers is that it's going to be one mannequin per person. We've reduced the paperwork down to an absolute bare minimum. The exam is a written exam, unfortunately. Um, that is something we can't take um, into a digital form, um, but everything else we have. And then we also have um, our COVID uh, training packs, which we've put together, um, which consists of face shields, hand gels, gloves. We used to have aprons in there, um, uh, face shield when doing CPR. Um, and then also we've got all the, the COVID measures. So mannequin lungs get changed every day, um, et cetera. So we put a lot of effort into making sure our, our training is COVID secure um, because especially in this time, we want learners to feel safe and secure um, whilst, whilst, whilst training with us. We don't want to put anybody at a disadvantage. Um, we've actually been asked to go to certain, type, certain customers um, in the past few months because their previous provider have turned up with two mannequins between seven people and the learners weren't comfortable. So we've actually gone out there with more mannequins and, um, you know, they've enjoyed the day. So um, for those who are first day trained, um, I'm just going to very, very quickly um, go through the uh, guidance that has been updated um, from the Resuscitation Council. Now, this is the um the the body who who basically decide what we are going to do in first aid and how we're going to do it and they've been doing this for for the best part of oh, 25 30 years i think this this all came together so that there was one um one body that says what we're going to do so where the resuscitation council guidelines um come in is in things like how we use defibrillators cpr recovery position and choking Everything else um, outside of this normally comes in some sort of like NHS guidance or or any sort of specific um, uh, indus industry body. And these are updated on a, on a five yearly basis. A bit like everything else, they gave themselves a year's grace um, because the, the guidelines were meant to be out March last year. Um, so let's very quickly have a look. So let's have a look at the changes from 2015. Nothing. <laughs> um, absolutely nothing has changed. We have gone through every document. There's about 17 um, documents ranging from three pages to 20 pages. Um, I have read every single one word for word, cover to cover, and nothing has changed. So if you were, if you were trained um, since 20, I'm going to say 2016, because we always get years grace to implement it. If you were trained from 2016 onwards, Everything you were taught then is completely relevant. Absolutely nothing has changed. So 
um, just for those first aiders, just to, to recap, um, just to make sure you are you are kind of up to date. So CPR, um, hands placed as, as in the picture in the center of the chest. It is still 30 compressions and it is still rescue breaths um, for adults. And it is still a case of if you're unwilling or unable to give the breaths, just do compressions. Um, with first aiders, I think you should be given the breaths. If you've been on a course, you'll, you'll know that I will really push you to do the breaths because um, it does give the casualty a better chance of survival. Um, but again, if you're unwilling or unable to do that, then continuous compressions um, is better than nothing. The depth of compression is still the same. It's still two and a half inches um, in the casualty's chest. You're still, I'm afraid you're still going to the speed of staying alive. Um, I'm going to put this on here. Um, there is a playlist on Spotify of all the different songs you can do CPR to. So by all means, have a little play about on that. Some songs appropriate, some songs not so appropriate. I'll let you decide um, which ones are which. Um, and it is still the case that we're going to put a defibrillator on them as quick as possible. Uh, with the defibrillators, it is still advised that anybody can use a defibrillator. There is no, um, you don't need training in how to use a defib to use one. However, it is recommended that if you're in a position where you're going to be using a defibrillator, you are trained in doing so. Um, the defib tells you where you are. The pads go in exactly the same place. Um, as a first aider, you'll be doing the CPR and a non-trained person can go and get the defib if there is one in the vicinity. And just to recap recovery position, in case of the arm nearest you goes up, the arm furthest from you comes over to their face um, and you bring their knee up um, with their foot planted on the floor, pulling them over and bringing their leg um, up to a right angle to make sure they don't fall flat on their face. Um, again, if you've done the training, this is all this is all recap. I shouldn't be telling anybody anything new, um, but it's always you know things like certainly things like recovery position. We take we do tend to forget. And the last little one on choking because this is where the recess council um, come in. Um, encourage them to cough five back blows between the shoulder blades. If that doesn't work, five abdominal thrusts. Um, and you're going to do that by standing behind them, putting a fist below their ribs and you're pulling in and up. And you keep on doing that on a ratio of five back blows to five abdominal thrusts until such time as it either dislodges and they start breathing again or they go, excuse me, or they go unconscious. Um, in which case we've, those trained in first aid will know what to do with an unconscious casualty. So there we go. That was a very, uh, a very quick um sort of run down the first aid. Anybody who knows me knows that I will blabber on about first aid for absolutely hours. Um, so I will stop there. Obviously, I, I would love to talk more about it, but I'm fully aware that um, we do have other stuff as well to go through. So hopefully everybody enjoyed that. And I'll bring myself back up. There we go. Thanks very much, Ash. Um, always informative as as it always is, I'm sure. Um, anyone got any questions for Ash? Uh, my only one is, I've done the one day course. Can I upgrade that just by doing the last two days of the three day course or do I have to do the whole three day course? You you can upgrade, but there is a time scale. Um, so the time scale is um, 10 weeks. So if you were okay. to have completed the one day um, and uh, or sort of if you've completed one day within 10 weeks of completing the third day of the free day then yes you can but it is a uh, each qualification has a a time scale in which it must be delivered okay thank you yeah, a similar sort of question um ash can you say so we've got sort of 10 staff and stuff can they over a period of a number of weeks just go in dribs and drabs to do a particular course or do they all have to hit it at the same time it's it's very much business dependent um you know as as a you know a, a business um I'm, I'm i'm going to take your business richard if i may um where, where you're all in an office environment um you know having ones and twos come on a course uh, may be better for the running of the office um financially that may not be the best route for you 
financially, the better route would be for us to come to you and train all of you in sort of one session, yeah. um, which may work better for you, um, you know, as a team building day, as a get to get, you might, you know, especially with what's gone on, you might not have had everybody in the office all at the same time. So it'd be no. a good chance for mm. everybody to get together. So it's very much uh, uh, by the, by the, what works for the business. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, we've been working with, um, with a, a charity who provide care services in Yeovil um, on Princess Street and they've been sending sort of three or four people on our open courses um, and they've actually decided now that it's better if we go to them and train six or seven at a time um, so absolutely it's, it's very um, it's, it's very fluid um, it, it's very business dependent cool I have a question um my other half's business is tree surgery, so I'd assume that's fairly high risk, and you'd probably <laughs> suggest the three-day course. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, with uh, any, anything sort of forestry, there are. Um, I would be looking at adding bolt-ons. Um, okay. To to so there are there are two specific courses um, for that kind of industry, which is emergency first aid plus forestry and yeah. first aid at work plus forestry. Okay. Um, so basically it's an extra hour bolted onto the course whereby they will learn things about catastrophic bleeding. Um, they will learn how to use a tourniquet. So catastrophic bleeds Monday morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, it's, it's, it's the risks and the hazards. You know, the majority yeah. of businesses do not need to know what to do if someone cuts their leg off. Um, however, I can imagine your, your other half's business you probably it's an everyday occurrence someone <laughs> really trying to pop a leg off or a limb at any point Hopefully. some are possibly more haphazard than others I was going to um, say it should uh, but, but again it's, it's, it's the risks and the hazards you know because yeah. obviously in that industry he will be doing everything that he can not for that to happen definitely I mean they've obviously all got the appropriate PPE and they've got their chainsaw certificates and licenses but would yeah. that mean we would have to book a specific course we couldn't go on to the open ones because we've only got uh, three full-time members of staff and then we've got um, two part-time subcontractors we obviously okay. the subcontractors well, one of them I probably would put on because he actually is um, does a lot of work for us yeah um, but our two groundsmen I was thinking they would probably be the ones that would need it most would that be a, a separate course because there's that add-on or would uh, they just stay so behind for an extra hour to one of your open courses that, and that can be yeah that would be the way that I would recommend it because all, okay. all, all of the content um, for, the, for the six hours emergency first aid, all of the content is exactly the same if you were doing a forestry one or a generic workplace yeah. one. So what I would suggest is they come on, the, come on the, the, the one day course with us and basically while the others who are just there doing the emergency first aid at work, um, whilst they do their exam, I would say to, to those, those members doing the forestry bit, just go and have an extra sort of half hour break while we finish up here. Mm -hmm. and then bring them back in for an hour and then we would add in those um the tourniquets and the catastrophic bleeds and i think uh, it'll probably be worth putting somebody on the three-day course as well potentially so if we had like yeah, one yeah. Plus, i'll probably email you separately to this ab ab um, absolutely absolutely chat. yeah okay. absolutely no problem at all okay. any other questions no no. it's only me and there's no danger of me cutting my leg off in financial services you might strangle yourself with your headphones then. I might yeah jump out of the window and the stocks go down well, well on that silly note I, I have a question for you Ash. has anybody in all your years of experience ever needed first aid at a first aid training session uh yes <laughs> um uh actually a couple of, uh was it last week might even been the week before ah. um, at the moment when it comes to demonstrating choking in normal times i would have a vest on with a big pad on the back and i'd have a it's almost like a big um like a big balloon on the front so people can show the skills on me but at the minute we're having to use uh use the mannequins and there's sort of little slots in the back of the mannequins that are, they're, they're put there to put them on the wall so you can put two screws in the wall and hang them up um, somebody caught their hand on that and um, sort of ripped some of the skin in their palm um, whilst doing the um, whilst doing the, um, the, the the back blows. Um, prior to that, a couple of years previously, someone who had a, um, a a head injury about three four years ago still wasn't quite right. Um, she she actually fainted in one of the courses. She fainted doing CPR on the mannequins. Um, so we had to uh, had to deal had to deal with that one. Cut cut the uh, lunch break very quickly. 
um but um yeah i mean there, there's there's plenty of stories there was a there was another trainer in exeter that i think i'm going back even before i started training about six seven years ago who had a heart attack an hour into a first aid course the the actual trainer himself wow. um so he recognized the fact that he was he was having a heart attack um and he had to very quickly explain to the learners if i go unconscious do this um it, it worked it worked he did go unconscious they performed cpr and they managed to save him but oh, it was wow. one of those funny things that because they, they never completed the course, course then? did they pass well they did in the end but they couldn't do it then they they, they couldn't use that as their practical which was uh, <laughs> so, so they had to all redo the course again <laughs> I had the same thing happen so, on a scout first aid course for the scout leaders I was helping run um, about three rings down at Shuppet and one of the leaders decided in the middle of the hike on the middle of about three rings at two o'clock in the morning to have a heart attack and we had to get him <laughs> airlifted off so heart yeah. attack in the dark in the middle of bad three rings is rather extreme <laughs> I guess. But. Yeah. You know, yeah, it, it, ha it happens more often than not. We we do hand out quite a few plasters in uh, in courses. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's just one of those more? things. <laughs> Anyone else got any other questions at all? No, not for me. No. no in that case, Ash, thanks, thank Ash. you ever so much for your time yeah, and thanks. supporting the Oval Chamber. Thank you, Ash. Uh, Very not welcome. just thank with you. this webinar, but obviously with your sponsorship as well. Um, it's very yes. much appreciated. Our pleasure. And, no problem. Um, yeah, what's coming up next? So at one o'clock, we've got Karen from Organise My Books talking about accountancy for small businesses. At five o'clock, we've got, who have we got? Sorry, three o'clock, we've got Peter Radford talking about effective leadership. And at five o'clock, we've got Richard James talking about Caterpillar Wars and IP and protecting your IP. So that, that's a fun packed day for the rest of the day and um, much more to come tomorrow. So thank you again, Ash, from Thanks Animal again, First Ash. Aid Brilliant. Training. Thanks, Ash. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Video will be available on YouTube shortly. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.